Hey, so does anyone remember my Mortal Engines video? Because if you don't, I very much recommend watching it. A, to stroke my fragile ego with them sweet, sweet views, and B, because this video may not make a whole lot of sense without it. You see, that was a video about the first book and subsequent film in a series called Mortal Engines Quartet, written by Philip Reeve, while this is a follow up video about the last. Actually, uh, on that note, uh, Massive, great, bloody spoilers for the entire Mortal Engines Quartet. Like, no hard spots on anything, I'm just going to shove it straight in your face right from the get-go and assume you've read the whole thing, and if you haven't, well, stop watching now and go read them, you unenlightened swine. Right, now that I've alienated, like, 99% of my audience... Hey, so does anyone remember when Tom and Hester straight up died? Oh yeah. Oh, we're going there. The Mortal Engines Quartet is my favourite book series of all time, so it's only fitting that it ends with my favourite chapter of all time. As I've previously alluded to, the final chapter of A Darkling Plane does something to me. It rips my heart out only to shove it back in with such force that it tends to ooze back out my eyes every time I read it. I gather I'm not the only one. The image of Shrike standing guard over Tom and Hester's decaying bodies appears to be permanently etched into more than a few minds. While searching for images to make last video's order true rambles more visually palatable, I stumbled across one such vision. Andrew Baker's incredible concept art that you're now seeing on screen. And here's the thing, it's concept art for the film. The scene is so legendary that the filmmakers had to ensure they'd get it right four films in advance. Correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I can tell this is the only art they commissioned for anything other than the first book. Making a video about the books and film, and in particular seeing such a beautiful rendition of the most visceral memory they left, thrust me back into Mortal Engines' obsession for the first time in a long while. So what did I do? I bought a whole new set of the books so I'd finally have decent covers, read them all in the space of one week, and made a second video about them. Take that, YouTube algorithm! Since covering everything the books have to offer would take a few decades, I opted instead to answer one simple question. What makes the final chapter of A Darkling Plane so effective? Today we'll be exploring my answer in a shorter, more freeform, and less... Uh, zany. Yeah, let's go with that. A less zany manner than last time. Think of it more as a conversation. I'm interested to hear your own thoughts and interpretations and your thoughts on my interpretations in the comments. So, let's sit in our nearest cave for a short eternity and take a look at A Darkling Plane and the Myth of History. For a significant portion of last year, I went through another period of mild obsession, that being a fascination with an event 3000 years ago that wiped out civilization and sent humanity into a new dark age. Heaven knows why. The Bronze Age collapse took place somewhere around 1200 BC. In the space of a single generation, the vibrant, interconnected world of the Near East, Western civilization's first real attempt at being a civilization, fell apart in spectacular fashion. A wave of destruction crushed the Hittite and Babylonian empires, severely weakened the Egyptians, and made everybody in Greece forget how to write. And I couldn't get enough of it. I sought out as much as I could, eventually arriving at a lecture by historian Eric Klein so interesting I bought his book. I've never read an academic history book before, but here we are. I think the allure of it all for me is the notion of this fully formed society lost to the depths of time, then reinterpreted by those who came after. A world so alien yet perversely familiar, and all we and every other civilization since have known are distorted fragments, people and events misremembered and exaggerated, eventually becoming myth. Until recent research by Klein and others proposed more realistic solutions, the prevailing theory for the cause of the Bronze Age collapse was widespread invasion by the so-called Sea Peoples. At least some of these invasions did indeed occur, but it's unclear how much of a role they played in bringing down empires. It is occasionally suggested that the Sea Peoples inspired the story of Atlantis. An amphibious invasion with the power to topple civilizations certainly fits the mould for a technologically superior underwater kingdom, but then again Plato did have a wild imagination at times, so who knows. A more solid example is the Trojan War. Historical consensus suggests the city of Troy existed, and was destroyed, and Klein himself believes a conflict of some sort occurred there somewhere around the Bronze Age collapse. Its true nature is lost though we can be pretty certain it wasn't started by some guy giving Aphrodite an apple. All the stories of the late Bronze Age lie the other side of a time barrier we can never cross, 
a dividing line between civilizations and collective memories, and they reach us only through the lens of mythology. It's all rather poignant, isn't it? These were people with lives as rich and full as ours, and every single one has disappeared, save the odd story mangled into an unfaithful mess. Anyway, mortal engines. If your memory of the quartet has disappeared in a similar fashion, or you ignored my spoiler warning, it may be useful to have a quick recap. Only the major plot points relevant to this video though, because, you know, uh, otherwise. Nope. 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 Following London's failed assault on the Anti-Traction League at the end of Mortal Engines, a radical faction called the Greenstorm seizes power, transforming the League into a quasi-fascist war machine dedicated to wiping out all traction cities and making the world green again. Oh, and they're led by the stalkerized corpse of Anna Fang. Many traction cities temporarily abstain from eating each other to form a defensive union of mostly German-speaking behemoths called the... Oh god. Uh... The Green Storm and entrench themselves along the spine of the Great Hunting Ground, and there they remain, committing various wartime atrocities for 16 years. The two sides finally call a truce following the Stalker Fang's apparent assassination, but oh no, she's put back together. Again, and journeys to put her final plan into motion without the Storm's help. She activates another ancient quantum energy weapon, Odin, turning it on both factions as she believes only humanity's extinction will truly heal the planet. Tom, Hester and a newly re-resurrected Shrike go after her, but Shrike falls out of the airship during an attack. He catches up with them too late to kill the Stalker Fang, but it's okay because some writer guy named Nimrod Pennyroyal did that anyway. We'll get him later. Shrike is also too late to save Tom and Hester, Tom having suffered a fatal heart attack and Hester doing what I'll euphemistically call a Romeo and Juliet. Accepting Hester's fate, Shrike decides not to turn her into a stalker, but consequently no longer has any sense of purpose. So he does what any reasonable semi-immortal machine would do and sits in a cave for thousands of years, shutting down subsystems one by one until the passage of time becomes a blur. He comes to when he notices a young girl placing flowers around his neck. He follows her to a humble village, discovering its people have forgotten all about traction cities, believing them nothing more than legends. He notices parts of their architecture are however repurposed caterpillar tracks from long dead herbivores, and their vehicles use a form of magnetic levitation invented as a more sustainable means of city propulsion earlier in the book. When asked what he is, Shrike recalls the original purpose of stalker technology. I am a remembering machine, he says, carrying the memory of the traction era when all else has disappeared. The series then ends with Shrike repeating the first line of the first book to begin the story anew. There are obviously many ways to interpret the books, and many ways to explain why Shrike in the World to Come, the final chapter, is so effective. I welcome you putting them in the comments, or perhaps joining me in the clearly lucrative market of a Darkling Plane video essays. One that I will explicitly not explore in this video is what the chapter has to say about Tom and Hester. Their relationship is a field of study in itself, so while clearly a key factor in summoning the tears, I'm going to leave it be. No, my thesis statement today is, the Mortal Engines Quartet is in fact about the concept of story itself. The story of the story is the story. This is totally meta. To see what the hell I'm on about, let's follow in Shrike's footsteps and go right back to the beginning. Specifically, Mortal Engines, Chapter 1. You all remember that line about Mickey and Pluto and how they're mistakenly identified as ancient gods, right? Or, in their absence, our tic tac overlords. Well, ignoring the obvious interpretation that our consumer society treats the intellectual property of corporations as divine, where have we seen something like this before? Just like the Bronze Age collapse, Mortal Engines presents a world where the past has evaporated, leaving nothing but mythic residue. The difference, of course, is that now it's us lost to the mists of time. Our lives have become myth. We get to experience the strange hollowness that our lives and times were, in the greater context of it all, meaningless. Think about Reeves' reinterpretation of Christianity, for example. Say what you want about Christianity, but you can't deny it's had a colossal impact on history. It shaped conflicts spanning continents, birthed the foundational epics of art and literature, and continues to influence global events and cultures to this day. But as we discover in Infernal Devices, hardly anyone in the distant future even remembers it. Like, even the symbol means nothing to them. Everything we in the present associate with it, power, 
reverence, a feeling that for good or bad it's a truly fundamental part of how the world works, is in fact temporary, fleeting, mortal. For comparison, think about the religion of ancient Egypt. Sure, thanks to centuries of archaeological study we know the names of the gods and what they stood for, but most of us don't exactly take them seriously these days. Ooh, a god with the head of a crocodile, how quaint. Ah, mummification, what were they thinking? Oh man, imagine writing with pictures. And that's a culture that survived the Bronze Age collapse. Imagine everything people of the era thought was an inalienable fact of life that we'll never even know about. Obviously, Mortal Engines is far from the only series to use this device. In fact, it's arguably the defining trope of post-apocalyptic fiction. Nor is it the only example to reframe our present through the lens of mythology, to make us the subject of ancient tales and legend far removed from the setting. But I do think Reeve's choices make it a particularly special one. For a start, our main character is a historian. Much as it's fascinating to explore the present of the Traction Era, stringing Tom along for the ride means we're never too far away from the historical perspective. Other dystopian fiction may feature characters who learn about the past, but as a very unresearched guess, I'd say it's a fair bit rarer to find a protagonist whose entire life is built around it. Much like our perspective on the Bronze Age or any other lost era of history, Tom's view of our lives is a mess, but not always entirely wrong. We're told historians have some inkling that compact discs were data storage devices, for example, even if they call them CDs. By focusing on this tangled perspective, Reeve forces us to think about history in the abstract. And nowhere is this more obvious than in the final chapter of A Darkling Plain. Distant futures in fiction are nothing new, but distant futures on top of distant futures? A Darkling Plain asks us to abandon everything the present holds dear not once, but twice. This leads me to one of my favourite passages in the entire quartet. Shrike asked if there were any places in the world where cities still moved and hunted and ate each other. The ones born laughed. Of course there weren't. Cities only moved in fairy tales. Who would want to live in a moving city? It was a mad idea. Reeve has spent four books convincing us a world of motorised cities can be just as real as our own. And then... Fairy tales. I don't think I need to tell you that a whole load of people think Mortal Engines is ludicrous. There's literally a video on YouTube titled Mortal Engines. Can fantasy get too dumb? And here, right at the end of it all, the author decides, screw it, they're right. But in the most meaningful and thematic way possible, because it does everything all the history and CDs and minions did to our world, to theirs. The world of Mortal Engines collapses in on itself, and suddenly, that's all myth as well. And while I'm dunking on people with bad Mortal Engines takes, let's address the title itself, shall we? Mortal Engines. What does it even mean? Well, you could apply it to a lot of things in the franchise. First, there are motorized cities that operate in a kind of ecosystem like living creatures. Then of course there are the stalkers, once human, now machine. And municipal Darwinism is repeatedly shown to be a failed ideology. So the days of mechanical cities are numbered. But the final chapter of A Darkling Plain reveals yet another meaning. By pulling the same trick on municipal Darwinism that he pulled on our present, Reeve generalises the idea of societal overhaul with a tantalising proposal. The engines of any civilization are mortal. Many theories have been put forward to explain the Bronze Age collapse. Climate change, earthquakes, people with spears crawling out of the sea. Eric Klein hypothesises though that none of them on their own could account for all the evidence, and instead argues in favour of a process called systems collapse. Systems collapse, in broad paraphrasing, is the failure of a civilization due to its own complexity. Because each element is so well connected to every other, a failure in one part of the system could cause a domino effect, and several failures in many parts create negative feedback loops bringing the whole thing down. The world of Mortal Engines models a complicated interconnected system like this by reframing society as an ecosystem. Cities hunt other cities, create more cities, build symbiotic relationships with cities. The decline of municipal Darwinism is then a weird, perverted form of ecological deterioration, dents in the food chain cascading through society until the world is on the brink of collapse. But then look at our world. Who's to say the same fate won't befall our tightly connected society? That our systems won't collapse? Is the engine of our civilization mortal? Reeve's message is even clearer when considering the role of the Greenstorm, 
They see the fragility of municipal Darwinism, but their system is arguably just as wobbly. The stalker Fang feeds her war effort by stalkerizing soldiers and enforcing recycling under penalty of death, clearly just as unsustainable an approach to society as driving cities everywhere. Thousands of years later, as Shrike wakes from his slumber, we discover both the Greenstorm and the Traction stats are lost to history. Both civilizations failed just as those of the Bronze Age did. Just as ours did. Reeve even makes this theme explicit earlier in A Darkling Plane, during Tom's final conversation with his old mentor Chudley Pomeroy. I've studied history all my life, and one thing I've learned for certain is you can't stand against it. It's like a river in flood, and we're just swept along in it. The best we can hope for is to keep our heads above water for as long as we can. And when we go under? asked Tom. What then? Pomeroy laughed. Then it's someone else's turn. But nothing is ever truly lost. Something survived the passage of eons and derived in the distant finale intact. Shrike. Here then we arrive at the moment when Shrike ascends from character to literary god. No longer just an unstoppable killing machine, no longer an adoptive robot father, he has now become the vessel preserving the very soul of mortal engines. The people of this new world know history only through myth. Like myths in our world, it's uncertain and embellished and full of flat-out lies. Shrike's sudden appearance offers something they, and we, can only ever dream of. The true story of history. And if you think about it, Reeve has been planting the seeds for this perspective for quite some time. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce the one, the only, Professor Nimrod Pennyroyal. First appearing in Predator's Gold, Pennyroyal quickly becomes a major part of the story, which is pretty appropriate considering he's a writer of stories after all. Well, he calls them real-life accounts of his heroic deeds and adventures, but they're not they are very much fiction. I think Reeve's decision to make one of the main characters of his post-apocalyptic dieselpunk epic a corrupt writer is a very interesting one, and it's pretty strong evidence that he wants to say something about the concept of story with the series. When viewed alongside Shrike in the world to come, we get a fascinating comparison. Because while Shrike's eventual purpose is to preserve the truth behind the myths of the past, Pennyroyal is all about that mangling stories beyond recognition life. Throughout the quartet, Reeve examines what effect Pennyroyal's lies and exaggerations have on the world. You would think they have devastating consequences, and in many cases they do, but it's arguable that more often than not, they don't. In fact, even after all his wrongdoings in Predator's Gold, he's able to escape without consequence to become Mayor of Brighton in Infernal Devices. He cheats death so many times in a darkling plane that other characters get bored of it, and out of all the characters, the good, the noble, the brave, the strong, it's lying cowardly Nimrod Pennyroyal who kills the primary antagonist. Many readers really don't like this, and yeah, I get why, but I personally find it inspired, and what Pennyroyal as a character represents goes a long way to making it work. He is the steamroller of history personified, its retelling and its corruption and the ultimate failure of humans to remember anything beyond its charred remains. The fantastical worlds and fantastical people who bear no resemblance to the originals. Even the great rulers and conquerors are at its mercy, powerless to stop their own eventual disappearance. Driving the point home even further, Pennyroyal ends the quartet disgrace and fading into obscurity himself, unable even to come clean as nobody wants to read the book where he tells the truth. The myths prevail. Except, thanks to Shrike, in at least one case, they don't. My own feeling on all this is that Pennyroyal stands for the way history is, and Shrike stands for the way it should be. And that's what makes the final chapter of A Darkling Plane so satisfying. Reeve pulls the rug out from under our civilization, pulls the rug from under the one that replaced it, then backtracks a tad. The engines of civilization may be mortal, he says, but that doesn't make preserving the stories about them useless. At the end of the day, perhaps a story is all we can preserve of them. And if it is, well, we had better do it properly. Oh, uh, you thought I was done, didn't you? Uh, how foolish of you. You underestimate my capacity to be even more meta. This is totally meta. You see, we can't talk about modifying or preserving stories in the Mortal Engines universe without acknowledging what happened to Mortal Engines itself. Yes, this book analysis is in fact a film review by stealth. 
which is kind of the reverse of my last video. Many before me have noted that the Mortal Engines movie is exactly the sort of thing that Nimrod Pennyroyal would create based on Mortal Engines book. And yeah, as I painstakingly covered in my last video, the movie isn't awful, but it is fundamentally a corruption. It made changes and rewrote histories, and if I may be so bold, turned Mortal Engines itself into a myth. Last time I touched on how the film solidified an image of Mortal Engines that wasn't quite true to the original, but even I failed to grasp how pervasive that effect was. Several times throughout the video I refer to the bare earth of the hunting ground as the Outlands. Someone pointed out to me that this is only a term the movie uses. In the books, it's always the out country. It gets worse though. When I reread the quartet after my video, I realised to my horror that I'd supplanted many of my memories of the book with my memories of the film. Like, I could have sworn Hester discovers she's Valentine's daughter at the end of the first book, but nope, it's halfway through the second. It's not even a minor difference, it has dramatic consequences for Hester's character arc. Even as I argued for book over film, I was unknowingly putting film over book. And I'm someone who knew and loved the books enough to make an hour-long analysis of their adaptation. For the people who know Mortal Engines through movie alone, I can only weep at how their view of the story has been altered. So, in light of the ending of A Darkling Plane and what I believe Reeve was trying to say about protecting stories from the weathering of history, I have this to say. Read The Mortal Engines Quartet, because it's bloody good. And share The Mortal Engines Quartet, because we as a society must preserve the story it tells in its original form. It's fine to have the movie too, but if that's all anyone ever thinks of when you mention the name, our culture has lost a true gem. Oh, and also, be careful how your own memory is preserved. You never know what will happen to it when we go under. Hey, so does anyone remember Oliver Mug? Because we don't. Uh, as far as we can tell, he made a video about uh, five-dimensional chess or something that went mildly viral once, and then nothing else of any value to anyone ever. Well, there are some theories he was involved with Thrive to some capacity, but these are unconfirmed. Thrive, if you're not aware, it's this game that's aiming to simulate evolution. It's going to be great. Dev say the microbe stage will be finished by the end of the year. Anyway, I should be going. I've been letting radioactive dust pile up on my lawn again, and the few neighbours who aren't already mutant rat people have reported me to the Ministry. If you find this recording, please continue my work. If it goes unfinished, I fear we will never know what happened before our overlords appeared. Oh, dingbats, they found me. Please continue my work. The truth must prevail. They must be lifted up. Yes, yes, that took way longer to make than it should have done. I only have myself to blame. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for watching. Next few videos should be a bit less niche. I've got one coming about music and maths, and then I'll finally get to that FTR video. Until then, thanks for watching, and see you next time. Goodbye. the previous broadcast, I was saying things that are untrue. I'm better now. All hail Kevin. <laughs>